Well, good morning, everybody. Good to have you today. And as we begin, I want to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to have a, a song of worship. I hope you'll join in. And with our band, it's going to be a great day today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come today and just to worship you and to be together, even if we're remotely and scattered. Father, help us today to see what your word has for us. Holy Spirit, speak to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's always great to have our band with us. Uh, I want to read some scripture for us this morning. Uh, last week, we started a, a, a series in the book of James. James is a, is a very practical book. Uh, the brother of our Lord, the half-brother, I guess you would say, wrote this book, and there's no book, no epistle in the New Testament that more uh, clearly parallels the teachings of Jesus than the book of James. But today, I want to begin reading in verse 9, and we're going to read to verse 12. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with the scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too is the rich man in the midst of his pursuits. His pursuits will fade away. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved... 
He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I pray that God will bless the reading of his word today to our hearts. Well, we've begun this series in James, and he immediately begins to talk about the trials that we face. If you'll remember last week, we said that trials were universal. Everybody goes through trials. You can't be so spiritual that you won't go through them, and trials come in many forms. In forms. Internally, we call them often temptations, where our minds and emotions sort of run away from us. Outwardly, they're pressures that we feel, or experiences that we have to go through that we didn't choose. 
And so everybody goes through them. And we said, you remember what we said about trials? The word uh, pirate uh, comes from the word trials uh, in this, uh, trend, in this uh, language. And it means we're being ambushed. We, we're walking along in life and all of a sudden a temptation flies in our face or our, uh, Satan comes after us or, or we have a, a terrible something that happens to us in our lives and we're ambushed. Everybody gets ambushed. The only, uh, only difference is how we respond to the ambushes alike. Uh, and, and here's what uh, James is pointing out today. He's talking about the example of a poor man and a rich man who get ambushed and he's saying, look, both go through this and they need to learn maybe differently and different things from this. But when they learn different things, they'll be all right. Do you ever watch the, uh, the uh, television show America Ninja Warrior? I thought about that in terms of uh, the trials of life. You say, well, what does that got to do with the trials of life? Well, that whole, that whole program is based upon overcoming obstacles. So men and women get there and they have to run over obstacles of water and climb ropes and do uh, extraordinary physical feats in order to win uh, the contest. And life is like that. We, we have to face trials and contests constantly in our lives. And so we can't just fold in and say, well, I can't do anything about it. That's no way to do it. You can't win a contest by doing nothing. And you can't say, well, I'm not good enough to win and I'm not going to really try hard because you'll never win that way. What you do is you give your best, whether it's uh, in that. I think about that playing golf. There are all kind of obstacles when you play golf. Uh, you know, there's sand traps, there's uh, woods, there's water, there's undulations in the green. And there are obstacles, there are things that you have to overcome to be able to win or do well in that game. Well, life is exactly like that. We have to overcome these trials and temptations constantly, and they prove our faith and build our lives, and it's very important that we go through this. So it's, it, we, we realize from what, what we've read here today about the bro, uh, brother of humble circumstances, and we realize about the man who is rich, that human dignity and human life have nothing to do with what you have. It has nothing to do with how many people know you. Everybody is going to go through trials Every human who's ever been born are going to go through trials. And so what we find out is that we all experience these trials. And I guess for those who maybe don't have the advantage that everybody else has, we, we learn self-respect. We, we learn not to beat up on ourselves by saying, well, you know, if I was rich, I'd be all right. Or, or, or if I had money, I'd be okay. There's something working here in James's mind that's important. And if we happen to be wealthy, he says, you should be humble in this because you're going to face the same trials. You can't be excused from trials just because you have wealth or prosperity or some power or fame. And what he's saying here at the bottom of the line, we find in verse 12, he's saying we need to live every day of our lives in this world, a temporal world with an eternal perspective. Can I just say that again? We need to learn to live our lives with an eternal perspective. When Jesus taught people, whether it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, he always talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He always talked about going to that place we call heaven. And so he wanted us to have an eternal perspective. So we are saved and given eternal life. And so we have this eternal perspective. And if we don't, we can get crushed in the temporality of all that's going on in our lives. We can be crushed by the pressures of life or the temptations that are within. In verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man, or blessed is the man, who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, that's very, very important. We're going to come back to that in a minute. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised, has promised to those who love him. We receive a crown at the end of all of this life, at the end of the trials and tribulations and temptations of life. We receive a crown from the Lord when our faith is approved. How is our faith approved? Our faith is approved when we go through these trials successfully. When we go through these trials successfully. How, how do we do that? Well, well, first of all, we do that with the right attitude. You have to have the right attitude. He says in the earlier part of this chapter, count it all joy when you fall into these trials. When you're ambushed, you can count it all joy because you know God is with you. 
And you know, Jesus Christ said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And the Father has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit in order that we can meet these trials. And so we might not like the trial. I know I don't like my trials. I don't like the temptations that I go through. But I can take a step back with an eternal perspective and rejoice knowing that God will take the worst that goes into my life the worst that I experience in my life and build my life and prepare me for eternity. We can rejoice in that even when the temptation is heavy upon us or the trial or the pressure is almost more than we can bear. That's, and then, then it says we need to do this with determination because when we put our faith in the Lord, we get perseverance, determination. I'm not going to let this defeat me. I'm not going to let this temptation overtake me. I'm going to trust the word of God. And the word of God says in the, in the uh, Corinthian correspondence, Paul writes that no temptation has overtaken any of us, but that God will provide a way of escape. God provides the way of escape. And there's nothing that comes to our lives that we can't endure in the power of God, in the power of the word of God, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to have this determination. First of all, I have the right attitude. And then I have a determination to say, this is making my life, my faith, everything about me better. And I'm going through it victoriously. So we have to have that. And then we have to have prayer. You know, James said, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask the Lord. I have to have prayer, don't you? We pray every day in our lives. Lord, give us our daily bread. Lord, protect us from the evil one. Lord, give me the strength to meet my trials today. Father, deliver me from this disease. Or if I'm not to be delivered from it, give me the strength to endure it and teach me. Lord, give me your wisdom. Teach me what I need to know about all of this. The right attitude, a determination that's strong, a prayer life that calls upon the presence and the wisdom of God is what helps us receive the approval of our faith. <clears throat> Let me just read in verse 12 again. Notice these things. It says, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial because he says when he, he, he has persevered, he will have been approved and then he will receive something. Let's look at e each one of those words. Let's break this thing down for just a minute. When, when you see the word blessed in scripture, it could just mean happy. Happy is the man who perseveres under trial and that's certainly a part of it. When you persevere under trial and it's over and you've won, you're happy. But it means something else. It means that you go through to your intended end. God strengthens you to get through it or get out of it in such a way that you find that God has done something in your life and you count that as a blessing. So he says, you're blessed when what happens? He said, you're blessed when you persevere under trial. So that's that determination again. You're blessed when you're grinding it out, even when the outcome is not fixed yet. Even the outcome is not determined. You know you're going to win, but you're going through it and it's very difficult. And he says, it's a blessing to persevere. When you persevere under trial, in the middle of it, and then when it's over. When you persevere under temptation. And when it's ended and it's over, you are a blessed man or woman. You're a blessed young person. You're a blessed young adult. You're a blessed child. Perseverance, it brings the blessing of God because it brings the presence of God in our lives. Now watch this. It says, he perseveres under trial, verse 12, for once he's been approved, your faith is approved when you endure. And when you've been approved, you're in that blessed state. You're approved by God. Well done, good and faithful servant. Way to go, out a boy, out a girl. You've done this. You've called upon the Lord. You've had the right determination. You've put your faith completely in the Lord and in his power and his presence. And you have endured and your faith is approved. Your faith can't be approved if you quit the game early. If you're uh, competing in that ninja warrior business, you can't be approved if you don't do anything. You can't be approved if you fall into the water. All they can say is, well, nice try. But if you get to the end and you hit the buzzer, and the smoke comes and the people are, uh, are giving you accolades and whatever, you've won something, you're approved. It's a happy state. The same is true for the Christian. When we call upon our resources that the Lord gives us, in the end, our faith is approved by God. You, you know, your faith doesn't need to be approved by me. I might uh, think it's a good thing or a bad thing. I might not understand what you're going through. I might under, not understand why you're sticking it out in that job 
or in that marriage that's so difficult. I, I might not understand why, why you don't just do something that I think you ought to do. But when God gives you the determination to trust him and endure a trial or a temptation, it's his approval that we le uh, lean to. It's his approval that we want. It's not the approval of man. You don't work to please men. The Bible says you work as unto the Lord. You don't do anything first and foremost for anybody else and their approval. For men's approval, it never lasts very long. But God's approval builds your character and life for eternity. And when he says, well done, it's well done indeed. But then he says, you'll receive something. So God does something. He gives us approval. But he does something else. He gives us this crown of life. Notice what it says again in verse 12. He says, when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, if you love the Lord, you're going to do what he says. If you love the Lord, you'll have the right attitude, the right determination. You'll pray for his wisdom. But what he says here is you receive this crown. There's a reward coming for those in Christ who bear the burdens of this life, no matter how difficult they are. And it's called the crown of life. There's this crown that's going to be given to you and me. This crown of life, which the Lord has promised. You know, the crown is mentioned many times in the New Testament. Paul talks about this crown of righteousness. Henceforth, he says, since I fought the good fight, kept the faith, finished the course, ready to be poured out as a drink offering. He said, henceforth is laid up for me right now, awaiting for me, this crown of righteousness that God's going to give me. Simon Peter talks about it. We read about it in the book of Revelation, how the elders take their crowns off and they throw them at the feet of Jesus Christ. What does this crown represent? I mean, there should be some reward for trusting the Lord, and there is. There should, should be some reward for overcoming temptation, and there is. So, so what does God promise you and me if we go through this trusting him and enduring the pain and the suffering and the pressure that we go through? What, what is, what, what's in it for us? That's a great question to ask. And here's what the Lord says. I'm going to give you this crown of life. Now, the way that's written is kind of interesting. It could be a crown which is life, or it could be a crown which consists of the life that he gives us. And so let's take it both ways for a minute and look in Scripture and see how crowns are used in the New Testament. A crown meant several things. For, for the writers of the New Testament who were thinking in Greek terms, uh, it meant something very interesting. It meant victory and joy. The joy of completing the contest and being victorious in that. That is so important. It means uh, the joy of winning and the joy of pushing through the joy of going through this. It's often said that when people go through basic training or they go through uh, 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 indoctrination in the Marine Corps or the Army or whatever, uh, when they come out of this, they're close to their buddies. Why? Because they've won. They've finished the course and they receive whatever it is they receive. They receive the, uh, the Marine Corps emblem or they receive the Army emblems or whatever. They're soldiers or Marines or sailors. And it means something. They receive something for that like unto a crown. When you withstand temptation and you live your life trusting the Lord, at the end of that, you will receive a crown of joy. Can you think about the unmitigated joy of being in the presence of God forever, never having to face temptation again? Can you think about what it's going to be like one day not to have to worry about sinning, not to have to worry about people? You'll be free to interact with people with no reticence or reluctance whatsoever. That's going to be the crown of joy. That's the reward for going through all this that we go through on earth today. And then there's going to be this victory. We're going to share in the victory of Jesus Christ. It's not just going to be the joy that we have. It's going to be the victory that we've overcome. In the book of Revelation, many times as, as, uh, as the Lord speaks to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he said, blessed is the one who overcomes. I'll give him this crown, this tree of life, this whatever. There, there's something about overcoming that, that God really loves. Jesus Christ overcame sin and death and the devil to be raised again and crowned in glory with many crowns and worship today in glory. We're going to share that overcoming victory. Because Jesus Christ says, I'm going to empower you to face whatever you need to face in this life. And you're going to have this crown of victory. It's not just going to be his victory. It's going to be your victory and my victory. It's going to be our victory that we're going to share in. There's something else here. 
When you wear a crown, it also means dominion. It means rule. You remember that Jesus Christ said to the, to the apostles, the disciples, he said, you're going to rule the nations. In the book of Daniel, if you read into chapter 7, it talks about how the people of God have been handed this rule of the kingdom. Kingdom priests to him now, but one day we're going to rule this world with him. We're going to share in the dominion of the Lord. One day every knee is going to bow, the scripture says in Philippians, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And we're going to uh, uh, join that happy chorus to say that, but we're going to share in his rule. You know, when Jesus came to earth, he came as a lamb. John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But he's coming back, not as a lamb, but as a lion. He's coming back roaring as a lion. And we're coming back with him to share in that victory and dominion. Dominion over all of evil. Dominion over everything that would ever threaten righteousness. We're going to share in that. But there's something else there. Notice what it says in verse 12 again. It says, this, receive the crown of life. Two things, life and glory come with that crown. You know what kind of life he's talking about? He's talking about a life that you and I have never experienced. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. What, what does that mean? Well, we think of it in terms of today. We think about, well, I'm living my life today and I'm living abundantly or whatever and here and there and whatever. No, he's talking about also eternity. This life of abundant life, it's life in the highest order. It's life in God forever. It's sharing the life of Christ without anything to impede that sharing. We're going to share the very life of Christ. Can you imagine sharing what his mind knows? Can you imagine sharing what he can do, what God can do? We're going to be in Christ forever and sharing that life. There's not going to be any restraints on us. We're going to share life of the very highest order. Life of the focus that, that's going to be strong and eternal. Then we're going to share glory. What does that mean? Jesus says in John chapter uh, 17, he said, the glory you've given me, Father, I've given them. What does that mean? Glory means something not just to look at, not something that maybe we would see somebody in glory today and want to worship them, but glory means something much more than that. It means complete Christ-likeness. It means to share the life of Christ. That means to share the glory of Christ. That's what the crown of life really represents. His glory will be our glory. Can you imagine what your life might be in glory? Oh, my goodness. You know, my, my life is, is fading. The older I get, I have aches and pains and sorrows. I see uh, uh, people that I grew up with passing away and family members passing away and all of that. It doesn't seem very glorious, does it? But one day in heaven, when we share the life of Christ and receive the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, we're going to be glorified. We're going to have salvation in its fullest. And we're going to be changed completely. Paul writes about it and says, today we're going through a process and we're being changed from glory to glory, he writes in 2 Corinthians, doesn't he? But one day that glory is going to be completely changed. We'll be completely transformed. You're going to receive glory and you're going to look like Jesus Christ. Paul writes, I'm sorry, John writes in 1 John, he says, we don't know how it is when he shall appear, but we shall be like him in every regard. We can't be divine, but we can be Christ-like and godly. And then finally, I think we need to understand that the giver of this crown is Jesus Christ. It's, it's Jesus Christ. It's the gift of God the Father through Jesus Christ who died for our sins. He died for our sins. He was buried for us. He was raised the third day. He's glorified in heaven today and offers that to you and me. That salvation, if we could picture it as a crown to be put upon our head, that salvation is full and free. I don't know if you have it, but if you don't have it today, this is what God would ask me to ask you to receive. The gift of eternal life, the gift of a glorified life, the gift of complete humanity in eternity. This gift is we, what we call salvation here on earth. In heaven, we'll just call it life. We'll just be living a life that's been saved forever and ever. But we have to receive it. We have to receive it. Listen to this in verse 12. It says, in verse 12, he says, The crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. What does it mean to love Jesus Christ? It means to give your heart to him. It means to trust him to save you from your sins and give you eternal life. 
You don't love Jesus Christ if you haven't given him your life, if he hasn't done something in your life to change you and forgive you of your sins. You don't love Jesus Christ if you just live selfishly. No matter what you profess, if your life hasn't been on a disciple's track where you understand what God wants and you do what God wants and you bear up under temptation and you pray for the wisdom of God and you live that out, oh yes, we fail many times. But the forgiveness of God is automatic when we confess our sins. And we have to receive this from Jesus Christ. We're not born into it. We don't deserve it. We can't find it on our own. We, don't ever, we can't ever work for it or merit it in any way. God's ready to give you and me this crown of life, but we have to receive it. And our love for the Lord is to love him even unto death. We'll follow him wherever he leads. We'll do whatever he wants. We'll speak whatever he tells us to speak for as long as he gives us on this earth. Our whole reason for being here is first to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior and then to serve him in the power of God for as long as we have on earth. It's not to live selfishly. So what do you do with a message like this? Well, realizing that we're all going to go through the trials of life, we want our faith to be approved. But that doesn't make any sense until we come to have an eternal life perspective. If you can only live from now to the end of your life, it catches you. It really does. We begin to think, well, do I have enough money? Will I have a job? We do all these things. Well, listen, if you don't have any of that, the question is not, do I have it and can I get it? The question is, do you have eternal life? If you start there and work backwards, then everything else sort of fits into place. Nothing can come against us and separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. Paul writes that in Romans. And so once we know that, that we have eternal life taken care of, then we don't have to be afraid of death. If I'm going to live forever, then I don't have to be afraid of death. And when I, I'm not afraid to die, then I can live in freedom today. This is the gift that Jesus gives us right now, to live in the freedom that he gives so that we never have to be afraid. If you don't have, or if you haven't had, or if you've lost an eternal life perspective, get it back today. Go to the word of God. Read the teachings of Jesus in the gospel of John. All he talks about is heaven. All he speaks about is the kingdom of God that's coming. And so we need this eternal perspective. And then we need to put our lives today, temporally, under the umbrella of that eternal perspective. Live eternally. And then endure the trials as a process. Don't see them as something that ought not to be. See them as something that is, that, that, something that, that those things that are. And then realize this is a process whereby God strengthens us and builds our character and approves us because we have endured to the very end. We didn't lose our joy. We didn't lose our focus. We didn't lose our love for the Lord, just loving him. And love Christ with all your heart and your soul, your mind and your strength. Put him first and above everything and everybody else. And until you can do that, you don't have the eternal perspective and you'll be struggling. But when you love Christ completely, when you love him completely, then he completely gives to your life everything that he can to help you endure in this life to get ready for the next one. I hope you're living eternally. If you're not trust Christ today, if you are, then be assured that whatever comes, whatever comes, you're going to be able to endure with the strength that God gives. God bless you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us this strength today. We live for eternity. We live for the day when we can be with you in glory. Help us today to endure. Give us your wisdom. Let us know joy even in the midst, in the middle of all of our trials. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And pray.